Stephanie. We will um, talk about global deindustrialization studies. Uh, and we have um, a very distinguished panel of uh, speakers uh, with us. Uh, the format, just to remind everyone, is that everyone has about seven minutes. Um, and um, um, after about six minutes, I will hold up a sign saying one minute, so you know that uh, you have uh, one more minute and uh, then uh, it's finished. Um, we have one exception today, which is a kind of uh, filmed presentation because uh, two of the presenters can't be here in person. So uh, Lauren will um, play that film. Lauren, I presume at the end of all of the presentations, um, we haven't really talked about um, the, um, the lineup very much, um, but uh, I think uh, we can do that uh, as, we, as we go along. Okay, I will probably briefly introduce all of the panel and uh, then we'll start with uh, Seth, who gives a sort of introduction to today's panel. Uh, and I'll probably also start with uh, introducing Seth. Seth Schindler is Senior Lecturer of Urban Development and Transformation at the Global Development Institute, University of Manchester. He's a trained urban geographer, interested primarily in urbanization and cities in low and middle income countries. And his current research interests are focused on the legacy of deindustrialization and contemporary reindustrialization strategies underpinned by large scale transnational infrastructure projects. He's published in journals such as International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, Urban Studies, Regional Studies, and Urban Geography. He's currently an editor of Area Development and Policy, and he's co director of research of the African Cities Research Consortium. We then have uh, Max Rousseau, who's a research fellow at CIRAT, the French Agricultural Research Center for International Development. And Max will be presenting on behalf of himself and Tariq Harout, who's a faculty member and um, research at the National Institute of Urban Planning in Rabat. Uh, Max and Tarek aren't able to join, but um, they've recorded a video and we'll be showing that um, at the end of the session. If you would like to access the English translation as usual in these sessions, it will be available in the closed captions function of Zoom. Um, now I have to start apologizing for mispronouncing names. Please forgive me, um, Neha Sami's research focuses on the governance of infrastructure, especially mega infrastructure in the context of post-liberalization urban India. She also works on questions of environmental governance, focusing on institutional analysis and state capacity. Niha is currently a faculty member at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bangalore, where she teaches on questions of governance and sustainability and she's also um, an anchor in the research program of the university. She's associate dean at the School of Environment and Sustainability, holds a PhD in urban planning from the University of Michigan, a master's degree in environmental management from the Yale School of the Environment, and a bachelor is from the University of Mumbai. Shriya Anand is a faculty member at the Indian Institute for human settlements, teaching on topics related to urban economic development. Her research is primarily centered on the Indian urban economy and economic geography, with a particular focus on the role of employment in urban development and in poverty reduction. She's recently been a lead on the UKRI funded peak urban project, as part of which she has been studying Bangalore's industrial transition and also been working towards mapping socio-spatial inequalities. Uh, she also works at the Urban Informatics Lab at IIHS, which analyzes, communicates, and disseminates data and information related to India's urbanization. 
Su Fei Ren is Associate Professor of Sociology and Global Urban Studies at Michigan State University. Her work focuses on urban governance and development from a comparative perspective. Her latest book, Governing the Urban in China and India, Land Grabs, Slum Clearance, and the War on Air Pollution, was published in 2020 from Princeton University Press. And what she's talking on today is part of her ongoing project comparing culture-led revitalization in three post-industrial cities in Detroit, Harbin, and Turin. Then we have Magdalena Novoa, who's an assistant professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Her work focuses on the intersections of heritage and social justice, the politics of memory, gender and deindustrialization, grassroots organizing, and alternative planning approaches in the Americas. Through her engaged scholarship in Chile, she has investigated the role of memory and heritage to challenge the impacts of extractive economies and deindustrialization in the country's south. Her work has been published in the International Journal of Heritage Studies, the Journal of Heritage Tourism and Planning Theory, among others, and she's currently working on a book manuscript about insurgent heritage. Owen Crankshaw's research addresses the urban studies debate on social polarization and professionalization in deindustrializing cities. Along with his postgraduate students, he has researched long-term trends in the pattern of employment and the changing geography of class and racial inequality in South African cities. This also entails studying the changing geography of housing inequality and its relationship to racial residential segregation. He's just completed a book entitled Urban Inequality, Theory, Evidence and Method in Joburg, which is to be published by Z Press. Anna Kalori, is a Rewire postdoctoral fellow at the Research Center for the History of Transformations, University of Vienna. Her research interests cover labor and social history, economic history, and global history. Her current research focuses on economic multilateralism and the non-aligned movement. For her doctoral studies at the University of Exeter, she researched economic reforms and deindustrialization in the former Yugoslavia. Outside academia, she's worked in the NGO sector in the Western Balkans and at the International Labour Organization in Geneva. And last but not least, we have Azad Gundogan, the faculty member in the Honors Program at Florida State University. The social production and organization of space and time constitutes the conceptual backbone of his research. While he explores various spatial and temporal contexts in the global south, his main focus is always on cities, especially those on the periphery. Specifically, he works on center periphery dynamics in planetary urbanization, as he observes in the greater Istanbul region. His recent articles were published in Urban Geography, and um, currently he's working on his book, provisionally entitled The Periphery, Extended Urbanization in Greater Istanbul. Apologies again for mispronouncing terribly certain names, um, but uh, I'm sure everyone, including myself, is looking forward very much to this afternoon's proceedings. And I'll hand over to Seth now for his introduction. Thank you very much, Stefan, for, for the kind introduction. And I'd just first like to begin by thanking everyone at uh, Deindustrialization and the Politics of Our Time. It's been a pleasure working with all of you. I'm really glad we could organize this. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Lauren, who has done a, a great job organizing behind the scenes, uh, without whom this really wouldn't be possible. Um, so <clears throat> I'm just going to share my screen because I have a very brief intro remarks. We have a tremendous group of speakers. I'd like to get started. But first, I would like to make three um, perhaps provocations, if you will, about deindustrialization. Um, and, and the first one is, is quite simple. I think we, 
we all know that there is a very long history of deindustrialization. It's not a new phenomenon. And for much of this history, uh, we saw a competition between bounded agglomerations and the loser, quote unquote, deindustrialized. So you can think here about the competition in the 1700s between um, the Low Countries and Languedoc for textile markets. <clears throat> Languedoc ultimately lost this competition. Its capitalists reallocated, it deindustrialized accordingly, and its capitalists reallocated investment into viticulture. This logic was flipped on its head in the late 20th, 20th century when the winner deindustrialized. That is, in the OECD, the most advanced industrial clusters were unbundled, in the words of, of Richard Baldwin, and production was offshore. The result of this offshoring, as we all know, resulted in the establishment of highly productive global value chains or global production networks, if you prefer. At the moment, um, what I think is happening is that we're seeing the competition between these well-established and productive value chains or production networks against the, the, these remaining agglomerations that have somehow managed uh, uh, to, to carry on um, and in, in low and middle income countries. And once again, the loser deindustrializes. So here we see a, a competition between networks and agglomerations. Also, what happened in this time, um, it was the, the early 21st century, uh, uh, relatedly was the commodity super cycle. So this encouraged producers uh, to reallocate capital or allocate capital from manufacturing and productive activities into primary production. So if deindustrialization in the OECD in the late 20th century uh, was accompanied by or even driven by increases in productivity in the service sector that encouraged capital to, to, to exit manufacturing and go into services, we see something similar now with deindustrialization in many low and middle income countries uh, in which producers are are, are disinvesting from, are divesting from, uh, from manufacturing and allocating capital to primary uh, processes. Uh, so we see the, the, the reprimarization of the economy that is essentially in resource extraction and agro-industrial uh, production. So as countries become natural resource exporters, this is reflected in urbanization processes. And drawing on the paper from uh, 2016 paper from Golan, Jedweb and Bolrath, we can say that erstwhile production cities that had a significant amount of, of manufacturing as a, their economic base are becoming per consumption cities and that their local economies are underpinned by resource rents and extraction. So closely related to this is a third point. And you'll see some language that alludes to Thomas Piketty here. In these consumption cities, returns to capital is highest in land and real estate, given the difficulty of joining or competing with global value chains. So capital accumulated in the resource sector fuels a construction boom and speculation and what uh, the establishment of what my colleague Tom Gillespie calls the real estate frontier. So ultimately, uh, the urban regime of accumulation uh, rewards rentierism, you can say. And the implications here are far reaching, but they include uh, in all sorts of things. Uh, uh, related to inequality, poverty, just everyday life in, in, in cities. Finally, and this is the last point I'll make, it's not really a provocation, but something that I think we need to keep uh, our, our eyes on is the, the deteriorating relationship between the US and China. Um, it's, as we all know now, characterized by competition and confrontation, and it seems like this will be a trend that will continue uh, in coming years. I'm not endorsing this article, but I do think that um, we need to understand, we, we, we all read about decoupling and strategic decoupling and, and, and integration, and to what extent will the uh, will US-China relations result in, in an emergent economic and industrial geography. My point is simply here that we, we, we need to account for that and understand how this will affect deindustrialization and perhaps reindustrialization in certain areas. So I'll close there um, and thank everyone once again for attending and everyone at um, deindustrialization and the politics of our time and hand over to our first speaker. Thank you very much. At, this, at that stage, I, I'll probably ask whether it is clear to the speaker in which order they are supposed to go. So is that is the me next?
because there was a name before mine but i wasn't sure on the yeah but uh, yeah max can't be here so if we go in that order in which i introduced everyone it would be niha next indeed perfect i will just start sharing my screen um So thank you all uh, for having me. Thank you, Seth, for the invitation. Um, and I'll uh, I'll take you guys uh, on a short kind of tour to 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 India. Um, what and this is kind of a, a, um, a sort of bringing together of work actually that uh, my colleague Shriya, who's coming next after me, and I have been doing for a while together on um, large infrastructure projects. Uh, and, and this is something that's emerged from the work that we've been doing over the last seven or eight years um, on, on, uh, on these large mega, mega infrastructure pro projects. So I'm not sure if most of you know, but in the last two decades or so, the government of India has been very rapidly emphasizing and pushing uh, sort of greater connectivity across the entire country and on building infrastructure that enables sort of uh, better connectiv connectivity. This is an ambitious scheme uh, to link uh, the country through, sorry, did that just shift? Um, to link the country through um, air, road, rail, sea, and, uh, and, and river ports. And as part of the scheme, they're also imagining this development of six massive industrial corridors that would link uh, the major metropolitan region, regions across the country. Uh, and Shreya and I have been studying the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor for a while now. Uh, we've also been looking at development along sort of other industrial corridors, uh, particularly in the South. Um, and this is the first time actually in the, the context of Indian economic planning that uh, urbanization has actually been explicitly called out as part of policy uh, to drive and, and, and leverage it to drive economic growth. Uh, over the last um, few uh, years, as these corridor projects have been getting built, governments and corporations have been using this idea of industrial infrastructure and, and the, the, the sort of settlements that are, that are promised to come along with it. So the, the corridors are, are premised on sort of a high freight rail corridor connecting the two major metros in, in, for example, between Delhi and Mumbai. And there are about 24 new settlements that were planned along these. Um, you know, of course, only one has barely broken ground and been built, but the, the promise of these 24 new settlements and the infrastructure that would come with it, uh, airports, uh, seaports, um, you know, new jobs, et cetera, have been used by governments and private corporations to invoke this idea of multiple promises of employment, of economic growth, but it has also then become simultaneously uh, a space of contestation, claim making, um, and, and sort of you know strife almost within local communities. Uh, these mega projects bring with them uh, aspirations of um, and, and imaginations of growth, which are unfortunately not always translated uh, onto the ground as these projects get built and executed. Uh, and these new uh, industrial cities that I that I mentioned, the, the new settlements that are proposed but often don't get built, are being sort of proposed and 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 you know, uh, thought of and planned in a context where not much actual industrial growth has been taking place for a while now, while existing cities um, become increasingly become locations for both informal industrial activity, but also the, the space for this kind of large scale manufacturing in and around existing cities has, has begun to shrunk. And so the sort of this tension that we see of investing in industrialization, investing in manufacturing just on the periphery of these cities, whereas, um, within the cities, the, the space is slowly dwindling. So the work that we've been doing through this paper has been to look at the corridor development projects and look at what happens when these projects don't take shape as planned. Um, and so these, so these are sort of images from our field work. Some of these are in Gujarat. Uh, some of these are just outside of Bangalore. Uh, and these, these sites are located anywhere between 40 to 180 kilometers outside of the city and range anywhere from 12,000 to 20,000 or 22,000 acres of land. And so it's a huge amount of land. They're the equivalent to large cities. Um, and in some cases, you see that ground hasn't been broken at all. If there are, you know, there are sort of partially built uh, structures that are, there are sort of, you know, half-baked infrastructure things going on. But the, 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 the arrival of these uh, kind of signals, to some cases, to local populations, uh, the, the promise of something better coming along. Um, the challenge, however, is that, you know, and, and uh, for whom are these being built and where? Uh, because these are being envisioned at national and international levels, uh, often executed through regional governments, with uh, local governments or local communities very rarely in the loop. 
um, there's immense amount of fragmentation and lack of, lack of coordination because economic planning in India is actually not aligned with urban planning. Uh, we need to take into account, and this is the crux of it, what do cities really need to become centers of manufacturing? Uh, and these policies and th these, these sort of proposals to build these massive new industrial cities don't really take into account these ground realities and the constraints on the ground, including sort of labor constraints, natural resource constraints, the, the, the kind of work that's going on in the ground. Just to give an example, um, Dolera, which is uh, along the De Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, um, has is sort of one of those 24 settlements and has actually taken off and gotten built. But uh, it took about 20, 25 years to get that process going, which was across two generations of people who lived there. And for those two generations, uh, a primarily agrarian community went from sort of three crops a year to two to one, where you know there was a, a complete shift that, that uh, local economies made and decisions have taken on the ground about transitioning their own work and their own lives uh, on the basis of future promises that were coming. And that took a very, very long time. And we're not even sure even now if they will actually be delivered. And so the, 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 the two kind of points I think that we need to start thinking about, particularly from, from the perspective of these uh, corridor projects and these industrialization uh, agendas being sort of built out in, in the Indian context is that the plans that we see are being sort of planned and spanned over 25 to 30 year periods but they focus only on the final outcome of the project uh, with consultants, especially more and more closely involved and sort of the projectization of planning because these are huge and they need to be sort of broken down into biteable chunks. The aim is actually to finish the deliverable, whatever that one del deliverable is, whether it's building part of a road or laying down part of you know, these, these sort of future cities that are to come without actually taking into account what happens if the rest of it doesn't actually materialize. Um, and, and we also don't plan at all for transitions. And so as these projects take 25 to 30 years on paper and eventually actually much longer uh, to materialize, uh, there are no plans for what happens to communities who already exist in these places because they're thought of and envisioned as so-called green fields. Uh, and so you have sort of half done the industrialization processes on the ground, the promise of factories coming, the promise of manufacturing jobs coming, which don't actually materialize. It also creates settlements that have inadequate governance structures to be able to service the needs of the kinds of people they anticipate uh, would, would come and live there. Emer emerging governance structures are regional development authorities, special purpose vehicles that are focused primarily on either the financing of the project or the successful completion of the project. And these are also, at least 40% uh, sort of, you know, uh, co composed of consultants or various private sector actors. Um, and their, their aims in being on, on these governing structures are very much to finish their work, to finish the project and move on. Uh, and there is really no long-term thinking in the, embedded within these governing structures. But unfortunately, these are the ones that endure. Um, and, and they become, they often endure and become more permanent bypassing or supplanting elected local bodies. And so as we're um, moving into uh, a really, really kind of big scale push in, in sort of post-COVID recovery, there's been a huge emphasis on using infrastructure, using manufacturing uh, as the way out of the sort of economic crisis that the country is in and the need to create, uh, you know, manufacturing jobs. Uh, unfortunately, what we're beginning to see is, is sort of this kind of misalignment of where it needs to happen, uh, where it's being built and where the investment is actually going. And so the, the concern that I have, and based on the work that we've been doing so far, is that we're going to end up with a lot of almost half abandoned uh, structures and settlements with, with sort of economies that were functioning in some way, kind of torn apart, primarily because we didn't think through these carefully enough and well enough. Um, I could talk longer if I have the time, but I'm happy to take more in Q&A. Thank you very much, Nia. It's amazing how quickly seven minutes go, but uh, that was great. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, and we go straight on to Shriya. Uh, thanks. I'll just share my screen. Give me a minute. That works. 
It's, it's visible. Yeah. So uh, thanks. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. Thanks, Seth, uh, for bringing us together. Uh, I feel like it's a very timely conversation. I think there's, you know, a bunch of folks, a bunch of us who've been thinking about the question of deindustrialization from different perspectives. And I think it's, it's really important and timely to bring us together. And thanks, Lauren, for coordinating. Uh, so, I mean, for my case, I think one of the provocations that I think really brings a a lot of us together from across different contexts uh, has really been Danny Roderick's work on premature deindustrialization and especially what this implies for late industrializing countries. Uh, in my case, I wanted to uncover what this meant for particular places, for particular cities or neighborhoods, uh, especially in labor surplus societies like India uh, that are supposed to be the beneficiaries of offshoring uh, of industrial jobs from the advanced economies. And I started by studying this question in Bangalore, which was considered a remarkably successful industrial city between the 1940s and the 1990s. Um, within the Indian context, Bangalore had been the beneficiary of state-supported industrialization. It was also the location of several large public sector firms with workers enjoying full job security, social protection, and other benefits such as healthcare and education. Uh, and along with all of this, the city also had a consciousness about planning for and housing the industrial worker. Uh, following the liberali liberalization of the national economy in the early 1990s, Bangalore's economy, of course, underwent a dramatic shift. I think this is something, this is a story that, you know, most folks here would be aware of. Uh, the sort of, there was this rapid growth in the technology and services industries, which also has transformed the city through a demand for real estate and consumption in a particular form. Um, now, in parallel, what happened to the industrial economy is that certain state-supported industries declined in this period as they were opened up to competition. Um, and, you know, they were sort of, uh, uh, but industrial employment at the city scale at the same time grew rapidly. And this was driven by an increase in the garment export industry. Uh, so what this really implied was a really big shift in the conditions of industrial work uh, from those in the pre-liberalization era with, a, with an increase in precarious and unstable work. Uh, now, really to understand these macro shifts uh, a little bit more closely, uh, my colleague Aditi and I have been studying the neighborhood of Rajaji Nagar, uh, which was Bangalore's earliest planned industrial suburb for housing small and medium enterprises that were connected to its large firms through networks of subcontracting and ancillarization. The suburb was developed in the 1960s and had both industrial and residential areas incorporated in it. Uh, and reflective of the socialist thinking prevalent at the time, the government allocated space for different classes, which included what were then called economically weaker sections. Uh, Rajaji Nagar, as this map shows, was located in the northwestern part of the city, close to several of the large firms and the go government institutions that formed a dense industrial network here. Uh, what happened following liberalization in 1991 is as several of the large public sector firms went into decline, uh, several of the dependent small and medium firms in this estate were also unable to withstand the shock and the opening up to external competition. Uh, many of them shut down and those that could redeveloped their plots in different ways to suit the changing economic context. Uh, so the images here, the one on the left actually shows uh, one of the small uh, industrial sheds still in operation as, an, as a small industry. And the one on the right shows something that has been converted into a convention center uh, and the next set of images again shows on the left, uh, you know, what this sort of uh, small form looks like from the inside. It's literally just one shed. Uh, and on the right, you see an image of what it uh, looks like converted into a marriage hall. Uh, so in many cases, it was just a simple refurbishment. It doesn't involve a lot of, you know, reconstruction. As you can see, it's just the same structure, uh, just looks a little different. So, uh, I mean, as you see, our existing frames of gentrification or real estate speculation actually don't help us understand these kinds of redevelopments. Uh, partly they took place on really small plots of land that were meant for small industries. Uh, and further the new users were adapted to the local middle or lower middle class profile of the neighborhood and its economic demands. So therefore we see the legacy of planning for small industry in the city created patterns of settlement in what are now core city areas that have been difficult for real estate capital to disrupt. Um, in parallel, the engineering industry that had been located in this western part of the city also had to restructure itself to make itself more competitive. In an attempt to cut costs, uh, the firms that were still left uh, in the industry moved out to more peripheral locations and continued to rely on outsourcing. 
Uh, but now this was to smaller and even more informalized workshops, which were located in neighboring informal settlements. So in areas that were actually former villages in this Western industrial belt of the city and were later brought into the urban boundary, a set of small workshops sprung up. These typically operate from small homes with one or two machines relying on unpaid family labor, and they now basically provide paths to the engineering industry at very cheap costs. Uh, so these home-based factories actually rely on a terrain of informal planning and were able to survive even though the small and medium farms in the government estate were unable to remain competitive. So using this case, we've really looked closely at the set of processes unfolding along with industrial transformation, which cannot straightforwardly be described as decline, but rather as restructuring, flexibilization, and more precarious labor arrangements. We also see shifts in the geography of production at an intra-metropolitan scale, including the peripheralization of some large firms, which led to disruptions in su supply chains and affected the associated small and medium enterprises. So we find that this set of changes is not adequately captured by the framework of deindustrialization, but it does have important consequences for land and labor markets, which we are really interested in studying further. Um, and so we offer an alternative for formulation, which we call industrial destabilization. And we've kind of explained this in greater detail uh, in a recently published paper. I know I'm almost out of time, so I'll stop here, but happy to just take more questions uh, in the discussion later. Thank you very much, Shreya. That's, uh, that's great. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to uh, this uh, intriguing case study and uh, the whole question and to what extent the term deindustrialization actually fits what goes on in uh, parts of the global south. Um, great. So uh, let's continue with uh, Xu Fei. Um, yes. Can you, um, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes. OK, good. Um, good morning. Uh, let me. OK. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm joining you today from Chicago, another post-industrial city. Um, but I will be talking about three other different cities, Harbin, Detroit, and Turin. Um, and this is a brand new project for me. I, I think in the, my bio, I wrote the word ongoing, but actually I haven't really started working <laughs> on the project yet. So uh, today will be a great opportunity for me to get some ideas and feedback from the experts on the industrial, uh, the industrialized cities. Um, so the project compares these three cities, one in China, one in <clears throat> the US, and then Turin in Italy. The focus of the comparison is how these three different cities use culture for uh, <clears throat> urban revitalization. Um, so by culture specifically, I will be looking at events, uh, different cultural policies, institutions, and also cultural facilities such as uh, museums, uh, performing art venues. Um, in addition, I think I'm also interested in comparing the role of uh, urban planning. For example, how different the uh, spatial strategies are for the three cities. And just based on a very brief uh, literature review um, I did a couple of weeks ago, I can already see some significant difference among the three cities. Um, for the Chinese city, Harbin, the main spatial strategy is um, counterintuitively its expansion. So the city has built two uh, large new towns and these new towns are bigger than the city itself. And for Detroit, it's opposite, um, it's a shrinkage. Uh, so Detroit has been trying to cut services to some neighborhoods which are not uh, very, um, uh, are not uh, populated. So, um, so it's the opposite from uh, Harbin. And for Turin, it's reorganization, uh, especially during the time of the Winter Olympics, more than uh, 10 years ago, the city has rearranged some of the physical facilities uh, in order to uh, uh, um, have a new image uh, for, for the city. And the bigger question um, eventually, I think I'm trying to get to is urban governance. So by studying the cultural uh, programs, institutions and policies, 
I want to um, hopefully be able to see something about uh, the distinctive modalities of urban governance of the three cities. For Harbin, um, it's um, very similar to uh, all other Chinese cities. There is a very strong and consolidated municipal government. And that government has authority over the larger metropolitan region. And for Detroit, the municipal government is weak. It doesn't have revenue resources to do things. And instead, Detroit has some uh, several very powerful foundations, private foundations, which are or have become movers and shakers for uh, in the city. Um, and for Turin, I you know. Among the three cities, I think I know Turin, um, not the least, not that well, but just based on a brief reading, I think the power for, uh, for policy making and also implementation lies in the hands of regional, the regional government for the Turin metropolitan region. Um, there is certain, um, there's, there, there is fragmentation, but there's also some degree of um, uh, collaboration or cooperation among the municipalities in the Turin metropolitan region. So that's um, um, one example of uh, the differences in, um, um, in urban governance, but I, I hope to learn more uh, um, uh, uh, details um, as I uh, um, dig deeper into, into the project. So um, for the last uh, just a few minutes, uh, the few minutes I, I have, um, I will just talk a little bit about Harbin. Um, so Harbin is a post-industrial, I guess we can call it post-industrial, but the word post-industrial in the Chinese context means uh, different things from um, places like Manchester or Detroit or Canadian post-industrial cities. Um, in terms of population, the population, local population is still growing uh, because it's a provincial capital and the city is attracting migrants from uh, the countryside. So it's not shrinking. And in terms of the economy, it's also growing uh, pretty at a high uh, rate, 5%, five percentage, five percent in terms of uh, GDP growth rate. Um, but 5% is um, low compared to uh, coastal cities such as Shanghai and uh, Shenzhen. Uh, the city of Harbin is relatively poor uh, if we look at the uh, disposable income per capita. It's around 6,000 US dollars. And the national average for China is um, around $8,000. So post-industrial in this case, um, it doesn't mean shrinking or uh, population uh, decline. It basically means a slow growth or slower growth compared to uh, coastal regions in China. Um, and manufacturing, uh, this, in terms of manufacturing, <laughs> the sector, um, the manufacturing sector has seen uh, some significant restructuring. In the 1990s, a lot of factories from the socialist era were uh, shut down, but the city is building a new industrial zone on the outskirts. So manufacturing is still strong in terms of uh, its contribution to uh, the city's revenue. However, the number one revenue generating industry is not manufacturing, but tourism. So as you can see from the picture, this is the main street um, of Harbin. It's, um, it looks very European because um, the city back to the early 20th century, uh, the city was basically Russian. It was a Russian city. Um, more than half of the city's population in the 1920s was, um, um, was foreign, uh, not Chinese. Uh, there were Russians, Koreans, Japanese, and other Eastern European Jews. Um, so Harbin was a major um, destination for uh, Jewish refugees uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And now uh, the city is trying to um, promote tourism and um, um, turn it from an industrial city to a, to a consumption city. 
So as I said, I haven't really started working um, on the project yet. And <clears throat> my plan is to start with Harbin and probably write um, a number of um, um, case studies focusing on specific places in the city. Um, so one of the key studies is a Harbin Theater, a Grand Theater. This is the new, um, one of the new cultural landmark uh, buildings. Um, and I'm also interested in writing um, a short, maybe a short essay about the new towns on the periphery. The new towns are um, so big. <laughs> there are two new towns planned and they are bigger than the city itself. Um, and people are moving from the old town to the new town. And another issue I'm interested in is historic preservation. Uh, this is a concert hall converted from uh, the city's old Jewish synagogue. Um, so there are many um, early 20th century buildings are or have been converted to a uh, um, new uh, cultural facilities. And um, uh, this, these are two pictures from the old industrial district. So this is the place where um, many factories were shut down in the 1990s and a lot of workers were laid off. Um, so I, I'm not sure how to write the, the story, but I do have some family connections uh, in, the, uh, in the neighborhood. So I may do some interviews with the, the former industrial workers. And another theme I'm interested in is- I'm really sorry, but you really have to come to an end, I'm afraid. Okay, sorry, I, um, okay, I'm finishing. So, um, so this is the last, um, <clears throat> last, uh, last slide. So I want to write something about the brain drain of the city and how um, that has affected um, the city. I'm sorry, Stefan, I didn't see your, your screen, so I probably didn't see the signs you are holding, but um, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a fascinating comparison and uh, uh, lots of questions, certainly in my mind, about this uh, idea of cultural revitalization, um, especially in the city of Harbin, which has this kind of shared heritage of Russian and Chinese. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, come back to it in the discussion and we'll continue straight away with Magdalena. Thank you, Stefan. I will start sharing my screen. Do you see my screen there? Voice okay? <laughs> Right. It, it's Thank a bit you. small, but I think we can, can, I mean, I can read it, but um, for some reason we oh. see all the slides, right? And then the oh. one slide. Maybe there? Oh, yeah, that's better. Much better. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for having me here and for this fantastic group and, and round table especially. Um, today in this brief presentation, I'll introduce my new research in Chile that uh, builds on the engaged scholarship that I've been doing for the last uh, six years or so with heritage grassroots organizations in Southern Chile, particularly what we're seeing here uh, in the screen, that is the ex coal mining town of Lota located in, in the Walmapu, which is Mapuche indigenous land. So uh, a critical finding of this research is that in the last decade, uh, women in Chile like uh, many other parts in Latin America, have gained increasing leadership in social organizing and public life, using cultural heritage and memory as a political tool to claim rights. In Chile, this also couples with women's experiences of repression, displacement, and resistance during the civil military dictatorship in the 70s and 80s, and the impact of its uh, neoliberal economic restructuring that endures until these days. So these women perceive this violence as an extension of the colonial legacies of control over land and Mapuche people, from which many are descendant, and the crystallization of extractive economies in the southern part of the country. 
Paradoxically, uh, their stories are excluded from official accounts about the dictatorship repression and even from the human rights movement. So building on these findings, my current research uh, investigates the historical tensions between colonialism, state repression, extractive economies, and racialized displacement in the Walmapu that have resulted in what I call wounded landscapes. I'm concerned with illuminating the connections between the various ways in which states uh, establish hegemony over landscapes, bodies, and memories, and also uh, to examine through an intersectional lens, uh, the ways that women who live with histories of repression and marginalization use heritage um, and memory as activist tools uh, to claim land and assert their memories and identities. So from the mid 19th century to the early 20th century, uh, forestry, forestation and coal mining served as instruments of the state uh, to assert control over territory in the southern part of Chile, uh, much of it covered with rainforest that had often been seized uh, by large landowners and private colonization companies and brutally burned and logged. So this process was uh, intensified during the civil military dictatorship and used as a weapon to the social and labor movements of Mapuche and Mestizo peasants, torturing and killing resident laborers, laborers especially uh, men, and expelling their families from the land. So I argue that state sanctioned planning has played a very important role in this large capitalist operation to surplant, transform it into sites of extraction and alienate indigenous groups. Through the ordering of space and the mechanism of erasure, planning has concealed, negate and normalized long histories of violence that continue to impact present conditions of indigenous and marginalized mestizo people and their environments. Heritage, on the other hand, has also contributed to the production of wounded landscapes by recognizing in some instances places with difficult histories as official heritage, but simultaneously advancing policy frameworks that are weak and fragmented and thus leaving these sites to despair, decay and disappearance. Wounded landscapes reflect the trauma produced by complex temporalities, layered histories, and different forms of state violence that continue to harm inhabitants and their environments, prolonging their inability to heal as psychosocial wounds. However, communities have found creative ways to contest and transform these histories of exclusion uh, and initiate a restorative process. They are using their collective memory and their own preservation practices as activist and political tools to reclaim land, legitimize their histories and contest heritage frames that exclude them. So for this particular engaged study, uh, we are working with two women-led heritage and memory organizations under landscapes. Uh, first, the one that we see here, um, the Agrupación de Detenidos Desaparecidos de Multen, and the memory side of the Multen Massacre, located in the Mayeco uh, National Forest Reserve. Uh, and basically, very briefly, uh, the story is that uh, three weeks after Pinochet coup d'etat in 1973, a delegation uh, made of military and landowners uh, toured this sector, uh, torturing, executing, and subsequently disappearing 18 forestry workers, 13 who work for the state and five for private landowners. So shortly after the massacre, um, the military disarmed the workers village and displaced uh, women and children from their lands. And also the land has traditionally been reclaimed by Mapuche uh, communities. So although the site was recognized as, as a national monument in 2017, victims' families are denied to access the site and in the landscape we find only these very deteriorated memory markers uh, built by victims' families by the life, but the life of the forestry workers and their families have been completely erased from uh, what I consider a wounded uh, heritage landscape marked by exclusion and oblivion. The second organization, very briefly, is Pil Pil con el Corazón and the landscape that was home to the disappeared coal mining town of Pilpilco. 
during the first half of the 20th century and as part of the Chilean state colonization of the Walmapu, the private coal company Pilpilco founded a company town to extract the coal. In 1976, the military dictatorship uh, as part of its neoliberal economic restructuring ceded Pilpilco's land to a private cellulose industry that today is actually the largest in the country and violently displaced its residents. So although Pilpilco was erased from the ground and official maps, uh, residents organized in Pilpilco and El Corazón with nearby uh, residents that stay and near what used to be Pilpilco. And uh, Pilpilco and El Corazón works to make these memories visible by collecting objects in a grassroots museum, placing signs uh, where traces of their town can still be found and organizes, organizing tours uh, led by women, like we see Margarita here in this picture, dressed uh, in their father's minor outfits uh, to raise awareness of their history and the cellulose industry effects on their lives and the territories. So to conclude, uh, these wounded heritage landscapes, I think that shows the complexity of uh, these transitions from industrialization to deindustrialization to reindustrialization that are very embedded in uh, and are still embedded in colonial logics. It also shows uh, how layered and spatial dynamics signals individuals and groups intimate relationship with places and therefore uh, do not deny them the possibility of care and healing. On the contrary, uh, I think that these landscapes are simultaneously material as constructed out of struggles as metaphorical and imaginative as lived and perceptual constitute a trigger for people and women speci specifically in these cases to organize and invent new strategies to repair their psychosocial and spatial wounds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Another fascinating paper, lots of uh, things to um, discuss here, uh, but um, we'll move straight on to Owen. Uh, Owen Crankshaw, is he here? Stefan, it's possible he was teaching a seminar um, ah, okay. when I checked in with him. So it's possible that he's still teaching. Um, okay, so, we so we'll, we'll see end. whether he will join us later and then we'll continue with Anna. Thank you very much. And I will apologize with everyone. I have a really bad cold, so you will probably he hear my voice uh, not at its best and uh, I will try not to sneeze in the next five minutes, but it, it might not happen. So. Um, yeah, so apologies again. And thank you so much for uh, having me here. I am trying to share my screen just a second. Okay, here we go. Hopefully you can see. Where is it? Oh no. You can see yep, it. We can, we can it see it, yeah. I think it's fine. Can you see the presentation or? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. So um, I started this presentation with these uh, maps. Uh, they are maps of um, former, actually currently still existing uh, uh, companies in the former Yugoslavia. And these are just the partners and the kind of exchanges that they had established from the 1950s that still exist. And as you can see, many of them are in the global south and in the former non-aligned countries. So in my research, uh, deindustrialization is somewhat um, the endpoint of my investigation. So I look at this kind of nebula of small industrial communities in the former Yugoslavia, which were once, as I said, joined in a network of production for trade with countries in the global south, 
through privileged economic ties with the non-aligned world. So what I do in my work is to analyze where deindustrialization meets deglobalization. So I analyze how um, globality and the removal from these global networks affects people's lives in its presence and its absence, and how people make sense of these global interconnections as a function of industrialization and how the dyad industrialization, deindustrialization, globalization, deglobalization shape their industrial lives and their experiences of um, work. So I look at how people articulate a sense of loss for an idea of geopolitical centrality, which they associated with, not only with the socialist system, but also with industrialization. Um, and I do so by focusing on what we could call the European semi-periphery, so the socialist industrialized world, and in particular, the former Yugoslavia. This is somewhat the other side of deindustrialization in Western Europe. In Western Europe, we have uh, uh, partly deindustrialization de by delocalization, and Eastern Europe was often at the receiving end of such uh, um, delocalizations. We can think of uh, Fiat in Italy, for example, restarting, delocalizing de to Poland. Um, and although this process might appear as having inserted Eastern Europe in the global division of labor and integrated the Eastern European economies into global market and production cha chains, um, the flip side of this was actually a deglobalization of many of the local enterprises, which had during the socialist times already built um, global connections, especially, uh, but not solely um, with uh, developing countries as a strategy for uh, global socialism to basically um, expand and establish uh, uh, um, itself and its, uh, uh, its own sphere of influence during the Cold War. Now I will bring an example from my research, uh, starting somewhat to from the more recent times. So here we see just some um, workers' protests, and um, in the year uh, in 2014, 2015. Um, we saw some of the most significant popular uprising uprising in the post-socialist Yugoslavia, and especially in Bosnia. So protesters were enraged by these decades of corruption and privatization reforms that had brought the Bosnian economy, economic system to a collapse. And workers of formerly uh, socialist, now privatized firms were protagonists of these contestations. So they witnessed not only the collapse of their workplaces in the material and immaterial form, but also the shift over new labor and property regimes. So they demanded to be heard and involved in the process of transformation that affected the work and livelihoods. And so they sought to reclaim a seat at the negotiating table of transition. And so these requests revealed actually the significance of labor and of working class identity as somehow the epicenter of post-socialist society and of its uh, conversations. And also they showed that there were actually unmet expectations of transition and of change um, in the post-socialist context. So here we see there is a kind of a dissonance between expectation and experience of transition. And I argue that this has to be connected with the experience of um, embeddedness in these global networks that workers had uh, lived through during the socialist times. So expectations from change that occurred in the uh, 1990s and the 2000s emerged indeed as the results of uh, these promises of progress, which were cardinal elements in setting in motion the post-socialist transformation. But um, when actually we look at um, how people understand and uh, uh, make sense of what uh, they imagined the change and transformation was going to be, uh, we see that these um, expectations were not produced in a vacuum, but actually found the roots precisely in these societies embeddedness in international and transnational networks. Yes, I'll be quick. So um, the promises of global integration were tangible to many people in socialist Yugoslavia who were not isolated in these backward socialist reg regimes, but actually had experienced the reality of global socialism in their everyday lives 
um, through integration in the non-aligned movement. So they were not unfamiliar with the dynamics of integration in this global division of labor and the concrete transformations that entailed. So, um, so workers actually viewed themselves as global and associated this kind of uh, um, their experience of working in an industrializing society as part of being integrated into the global market and what emerged actually from transition and particularly after uh, um, the market reforms of the 1990s and 2000s uh, was actually a shrinking um, of not only these companies size or industrial output, but also of their global outlook. So um, deindustrialization and transition um, actually meant um, for workers a kind of a denial or a removal of the imagined global ambitions that they had built during uh, the um, socialist period and they had consolidated thanks to the non-line movement. So, um, I will just, since I have to kind of uh, conclude quite quickly, um, I think that um, understanding deindustrialization as a process in theory um, in the uh, post socialist context, so as a part of an unfinished transition, allows us to render the working class subjectivities visible to um, and to counter a narrative of um, them being marginalized. And so I think that. Um, viewing post-socialist transition within the framework of deindustrialization and deglobalization can help us uh, to nuance views of transformation in the region and problematize the history of globalization here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, very, very interesting um, case study. I think former Yugoslavia, some of the companies persisted for a long time into the 1990s, intriguingly. Um, and were only sort of, as far as I understand it, hit by uh, EU regulations mainly, but we can discuss that uh, also later and um, move straight on to uh, Uzat. Okay, um, can you give me a second, please? All right, yes. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Thank you for inviting me uh, to this very informative conversation uh, about deindustrialization. I'm an urban sociologist and uh, in my research, I have focused mainly on the greater Istanbul area, but my research is not about the Istanbul. Instead, I look at the urbanization processes uh, beyond Istanbul or peripheralization, if you will, and uh, how officials, uh, both uh, local and central, um, devised urban and regional planning strategies, uh, always prioritizing Istanbul and at the expense of peripheral cities and uh, their communities. But how do I describe uh, the local particularities of the industrialization in Istanbul within the context of center periphery dynamics? As I see it, um, the industrialization of Istanbul is inherently a relocation process. Starting in the mid 1960s, Istanbul master plans and Turkish government's uh, national development plans have uh, progressively uh, devised uh, strategies to control um, both urban growth, relentless urban growth, and uh, intense uh, industrialization. I'm not gonna go over uh, each of these plans, uh, but let me highlight some aspects of them while we are taking a look at the details. Um, as you see, I have divided these plans into two periods as pre and post 1980. 1980 is the year when military coup d'etat brought about a structural adjustment program, a kind of manifestation of shock doctrine uh, that started rolling back phase of Turkish neoliberalization. Between 1960 and 1980, Turkish economy was characterized by a national development strategy through import substitution and manufacturing. And even in the pre-neoliberal era, these plans reflected an interest in organizing industry, the industrialization of inner city areas and relocation of industry in the peripheral areas. So the regional scope uh, is obvious right from the beginning. With the neoliberalization, however, uh, the regional focus is still obvious and uh, the imperatives of the industrialization of Istanbul is now associated with world 
city or global city aspirations, uh, which uh, refer to clean industries such as IT, uh, tourism, finance, um, and uh, or historical preservation and um, you know um, environmental uh, protection. What were the results of deindustrialization or and relocation of Istanbul-based industry? Well, uh, after a long period of being trapped within nation state boundaries until the 1980s, uh, Istanbul reappeared on the stage of global cities or city regions. Um, it is considered a, now, you know, um, considered a regional hub of uh, finance, logistics, tourism, and culture uh, at the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And uh, almost everyone around the world is familiar with uh, these circulating images, very polished, somewhat orientalist images of Istanbul. Um, authorities uh, have promoted Istanbul to attract multinational corporations and uh, devised policies uh, to maintain its capacity for trade, creativity, uh, innovation, and uh, entrepreneurialism. Um, the relocation process of industrial plants toward the peripheral areas uh, beyond Istanbul's administrative borders um, gained pace, especially in the 1990s, um, when a rollout phase of uh, new liberalization started. And especially since the post 2000s, the deindustrialization of Istanbul and other major cities in Turkey, the main development strategy has uh, been based on state-led uh, real estate development, uh, popularly known as urban transformation. Um, this has a lot of implications for urban governance and uh, urban studies on Turkey um, have done a great job in terms of documenting all these processes. Um, so other types of implications for urban uh, transformation uh, or urbanization processes in this era uh, included accumulation strategies and uh, perhaps rising authoritarianism and how urbanism under uh, the current regime has been a bastion of um, you know, uh, a specific urbanism in Turkey as we observe um, today. So we know the end of the story. Uh, Istanbul is a third tier global city or a mega city, uh, but what was happening to the other half of the equation, uh, that is the peripheral cities where the industry were pushed to, so my main goal has been to explain the peripheral city formation as uh, integral to the deindustrialization story right from the beginning, not as an additive account. Um, so in my research, I shift my focus to the peripheral cities beyond Istanbul's official borders. And I am specifically looking at cities uh, which were once small agricultural towns uh, turned gigantic, polluted, non-cities of migrant workers uh, in only a couple of decades. Uh, Gebze, as I look at it, is such a periphery, peripheral city. Uh, it is located just southeast of Istanbul and is officially a district of Kojeli province. Um, and uh, it's a great location for relocating industry for Istanbul-based uh, manufacturing businesses. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it's an advantageous uh, location because of its proximity to Istanbul, apparently. Uh, it's far enough to push away the negative externalities of Istanbul's uh, relentless expansion. And also it's a pool, a uh, labor pool for uh, the industry there. So uh, eventually we have Gebze. Uh, in, uh, Gebze is like Snow White cleaning the house and all the cooking of Istanbul, but it is not as beautiful as Snow White uh, because it is the ugly stepsister in this tale of two cities, uh, which is far from a fairy tale for uh, the communities of Gebze, laboring migrant communities of Gebze. Um, social, economic, and environmental problems wrought by uh, intense and rapid urbanization made the area not ideal to live, work, and have fun. Migrants from all over Turkey were lured by the prospect of finding a job in manufacturing uh, for decades. Um, and they established densely populated squatter neighborhoods 
that we now know as Geja Kondus uh, and have suffered for decades from the lack of sufficient social and municipal amenities. Uh, it's a district that is bigger, richer, and more crowded than most provinces. Um, but, you know, it's not rich when it comes to, um, you know, giving the share uh, to this wealth it creates through industrialization to its community members. Um, its administrative status as a gigantic district, uh, not a province, defies all logic of provincial organization. So um, that's all for now. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions uh, during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Uzat. Uh, fascinating um, case of um, decentering uh, industry um, in Istanbul. Um, I think Owen has joined us now. Is that right, Owen? You are here. Yes, I'm here. Hello, sir. Great. Hi. Hi. So over to you. Okay. Thank you. How much? How much time have I got? Five minutes. Uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'll manage that fine. Okay. My my work has been looking at. <clears throat> deindustrialization from the point of view of the social polarization debate between Saskia Sassen and Chris Hamlet. Okay, so just to remind you, Saskia's argument originally was that the decline of manufacturing employment leads to the polarization of the earnings and occupational structure because the manufacturing sector has more middle income workers and the services sectors have more high income and low income workers, but fewer middle income workers. So the greater the service sector becomes, the more polarized the employed workforce becomes in terms of earnings. Okay, so we, my students and I, particularly uh, Dr. Borel Saladin, looked at Johannesburg and we checked it out and it's got definitely undergone or underwent quite a serious decline in manufacturing employment. But much to our surprise, the results showed that the deindustrialization was not accompanied by polarization. It was accompanied by professionalization, which is Hamlet's response to Sasson based on his work in Europe and London. And so what we found is that the, prof the high income professional managerial and technical employment grew much more than low income employment in the service sector, uh, but low income jobs generally. And, uh, and there was also actually a lot of growth in middle income clerical and sales work and service sector work. So that was a surprise. Uh, so what's interesting is that the, you know, Sassen is quite right. If you get manufacturing decline, you do see a slow rate of growth of middle income manual jobs, if not a decline. We, we got a very slow growth, rate of growth. But um, with, you know, with, but what you didn't expect, what you didn't predict, is that they, under certain conditions, and this is not the case for London, and I think it's not the case for New York, but it certainly is the case for Johannesburg, large amounts of clerical and sales jobs, which are middle income jobs. Uh, and so, you know, that's completely changed. You know, the picture is very different. And get, consistent with Hamlet's argument, what the, the new inequality of sort of post-industrial cities is that you have a workforce that's more and more skilled and better paid alongside growing unemployment. And we've looked at this quite closely and the, the pattern there is that the demand for more and more skilled workers seems to have contributed to unemployment because unemployed workers are largely poorly educated. The sort of workers who would be employed in low skilled manual jobs and at best in, well, and in middle income factory work, you know, semi-skilled machine operative work. Um, so that, that, that's the big finding. And then for the deindustrialization people, you'd be very interested to notice that we did then a test to see you know, what is the statistical cause of this trend. And we found that it, it really wasn't, we used a shift share analysis and we found it really wasn't deindustrialization. The deindustrialization, the decline of employment in the manufacturing sector explained the slow rate of growth of middle income manual workers. But it did not explain the slow rate of growth amongst low skilled and low income workers, and it didn't explain the growth of high income workers. That you know, growth in both those were actually was caused largely by growth in within sectors, 
not by the decline of manufacturing, the growth of the services sector. So there's something else going on here, which we think has more to do with the way that production is organized and the way that, uh, yeah, the way that production is organized. So the demand for labor is changing within all sectors, uh, even though deindustrialization had some effect. It didn't explain the growth of high income workers. So that was, a, yeah, that was a very neat result we got out of a study of Greater Johannesburg. And we're looking at long-term trends from 1970 to 2011. Yeah, and the, I've got a little bit of time left. I've got another thing I can say. Uh, yeah, you've still got three minutes. The other thing that Sasson argues is that, and this is quite common amongst the post fordists in literature, on, on urban inequality is that black migrants to cities, or because blacks were migrants to cities after European uh, migration to say American cities in particular, um, they argue that this polarized occupational structure has concentrated low skilled black workers, in other words, most black workers in their view, in these low skilled jobs. But in South Africa and Johannesburg in particular, this hasn't been the case. Um, Blacks of all races have been upwardly mobile into both high income jobs uh, to, and to even greater extents in middle income non manual jobs. So there's been a lot of mobility, upward mobility into these growing better paid jobs. But of course, less, less educated blacks have suffered higher levels of unemployment because of the lack of growth of manual middle income jobs and manual low income jobs. So it's, you know, so, so, so if you like, a lot of poorly educated blacks are concentrated in unemployment rather than in low, low wage jobs. And they haven't been excluded from high income jobs, which is a, you know, quite a positive finding really, but also quite a tragic one at the same time. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, very good uh, on timekeeping and uh, interesting results. Um, yeah, now um, we've all been very patient and listened to lots of interesting uh, papers and much food for thought. Um, we still have the video of uh, Max and uh, Tarek, but um, um, I, I would probably suggest that we'll open up discussion first and see um how much uh, desire for discussion there is and lauren can perhaps put the uh, video of the talk in the chat so that everyone can already download it and uh, watch it um and uh, uh if uh, there is uh, not much desire for discussion which i can barely believe uh, we will also have time to uh, watch the video but uh, i think that uh, Given that we have now another 40 minutes, I would, and, and we have been listening for uh, 80 minutes, uh, I think we should uh, we should open up uh, discussion. Um, so uh, please use the hand function of Zoom so that uh, I can uh, see uh, you, because with 51 participants, I cannot see everyone on the little um, little um, screens that I have in front of me. Uh, and you can also use the chat function, of course. And uh, I've been already monitoring the chat and have seen that Stephen has run a running commentary on uh, the papers. Uh, <laughs> lots of interesting uh, thoughts, but I won't uh, read the running commentary, but maybe as a start, I can hand the word to Stephen because he has lots of interesting things to say. <laughs> well, they're just meant as comments, not, not questions. Like, I guess maybe if I had one question would be about I guess our frames of analysis that that um, you know we see here like the neighborhood we see we see sort of the city as an as a frame um, and so I'm wondering what what different frames offer and what they sort of foreclose and I, I sort of made a comment around I find sometimes with like the urban frame or the citywide frame that that really privileges uh, state actors um, and and perhaps. Um, you know, sidelines are our sort of analysis of, of, of capital or corporate actors. And so I, I'd love to hear some of your reflections on that. Um, uh, that said, I'm not saying state actors are unimportant, they're, they're central. And, 
you know, we see that over and over again throughout all the all the papers. And there's probably reasons why why you are you are sort of privileging state actors here. Um, but I, I I was sort of thinking a little bit around around sort of the scale analysis and the frames we use to sort of think about these changes. Um, yeah, sort of a comment more than a question. Thanks, Stephen. I think that's a big question, a great question. I think uh, the sort of where is capital in all of this uh, story? Uh, maybe if there are other questions, I would suggest to um, to collect for a little while and then hand back to the panel. Um, so please uh, raise your hands or use the chat um, if you have a question. Yes, there's. Uh, one uh, there um, by, again, apologies, uh, Pius. Piusha. Piusha, sorry, yeah. Piusha, over to you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I have a quick question to uh, Neha and Shia, whoever wants to answer. And I was just like, what I see from what you presented and what I also saw from my own experience is that there is this intensification of industrial industrialization while there is also this parallel sort of deindustrialization and also in a way post-industrial uh, th there are these threads of post-industrial in uh, for example Bangalore I was wondering what does it do to women's labor like is this landscape also gendered in terms of labor and if you have any thoughts on that thank you Great question. Thank you very much. Uh, Su Fei, you also have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank Seth for connecting us with our Canadian colleagues. I was browsing your website, uh, Depot, and learned so much from just the, the, the things you posted on your website. I'm reading some of your books. <laughs> I checked out this book from our library, and I just find it very, very new for me, but also interesting. So I wonder if uh, either maybe Stefan or Steve, you can talk a little bit, maybe in a few sentences, tell us a little bit about your project and what, what are the major things or themes for, uh, for, for your group? Uh, and if you can maybe project a little bit to the future, what are the new directions for, um, um, for the field studying post-industrial cities? So um, I'm, I'm just, uh, this is a brand new topic for me. So I'm really eager to learn from, from the experts on, on the topic. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, we need to add another hour now, I think. Uh, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over straight to Indra. Welcome there. Or I can, I can, yeah. So the question is for Sreya, Sreya Anand. Thank you, Sreya, for your presentation. Uh, in your case study, you said the change is about destabilization instead of the industrialization. It is a better way to explain the change. My understanding is the industrialization is always connected with destabilization of work life. And the society is always in flux when industrialization happens. So how does the use of the concept of destabilization will help us to understand the change uh, from industrial industrialization to deindustrialization? Thank you very much, Indra. Um, and then I'm sorry, I can't see the name. D, D. Wilson too. <laughs> you need to unmute yourself. Yes, I can be heard. Perfect. Fantastic, thanks. Um, I feel a little bit like an intruder in this. So thank you everyone for, for having me. I'm coming from the US, North America. Um, just a small question for Owen. Um, really interesting talk. Thanks very much for it. Um, and the small question is that I wonder if it makes sense to think about possible links between deindustrialization and growth of well-paying, often high-tech jobs in cities across the globe because you suggested there was not evidence for that connection. But it seems to me that um, when we see deindustrialization, we see the notorious reality of land devaluation. 
and the devaluation of fixed capital assets and, and, and land in particular. And that often sets the stage for different kinds of capital to move into those spaces. And um, it's a capital that often pays higher wages. And it's a capital that, that is often, for example, high tech. And I see this going on continuously now in Chicago. I'm just south of Chicago. So I'm wondering if it makes sense to, to begin trying to make those kinds of connections. Great, thanks very much. Um, Seth. Thank you. Um, my question is for Anna, but really uh, maybe something that other people would like to, to, to speak to. You spoke, you told us about how the connections forged between Yugoslavian enterprises and other non-aligned movement countries during the Cold War were disrupted uh, at the end of that, the, the Cold War in order. I would think of it as an order rather than necessarily a conflict. Mm. And then of course, you, they were completely erased and forgotten in, in, in the kind of period in the unipolar order when the US was the so-called liberal Leviathan. But if we're re-entering some sort of, I don't know if we'd call it a, a new Cold War, a second Cold War, or just simply a multipolar order characterized by competition between the US and China, do you see any scope for either reinvigorating or resurrecting those connections, forging new ones? I know, you know, Serbia, for example, is, is caught between the US and China. And I think the Balkans is a pretty tricky, interesting place at the moment um, with EU politics, US and China. So I just wonder if, if uh, that's a very specific question, but more generally, could this multipolar order result in some sort of new I don't know if it's a non-aligned movement, third worldism, some sort of, uh, is there scope for some sort of progressive politics that could come out of it? Thanks very much, uh, Seth. Um, I think uh, for the time being, I see no more uh, hands and we had some questions that were specifically asked uh, to presenters and others were more generally addressed uh, to everyone. Maybe we could start with those uh, specific uh, question. I think, um, uh, maybe starting with Indra, Indra's question and to what extent um, destabilization helps us to understand deindustrialization, um, which was uh, addressed, I think, uh, specifically uh, to Shreya, if, if that's if I remember that correctly. Yes, yes that's right. I'm happy to take that. Uh, thanks, Indra. Thanks for the question. So, I mean, of course, absolutely agree that uh, you know industrialization and industrial change sort of always. Uh, accompanies these kinds of transformations. But I think we are looking at a very particular set of changes which have taken place in the last, I would say, two or three decades, which you know have really uh, accompanied the opening up uh, of Bangalore, in particular for Bangalore, right? Uh, opening up of the economy to external competition. And uh, you do see a sort of, you know, across the board decline in protected work in, you know, um, in stable jobs. Uh, particularly within the industrial economy, and you see a, a rise in informalization. And this is something which we see definitely in Bangalore, because and the transformation from what was there before to now is, you know, very, very evident, given how, uh, you know, Bangalore was the site of state-supported industrialization. And I mean, this is why, you know, I, I mean, I'm using destabilization, but it, it is capturing a set of trends towards fle flexibilization of labor, towards, you know, work in, you know, small, contracted out, informal, uh, you know, workshops, essentially. And I'm also using the terms destabilization in the paper to really talk about a shifting geography, but I think in a different way than deindustrialization studies, it's a, it's, a, it's a subtle difference. But I think in deindustrialization studies, there was this speak, speaking of you know, uh, destabilization at a global scale, right? We are looking at the movement from advanced industrial company uh, countries to uh, developing countries. But uh, what I'm looking at in the Bangalore context is really what these shifts within the city scale uh, imply for connections, for, you know, networks of industries, which are really closely to tied together in space. Um, so, so that's kind of why I use uh, the term destabilization. Uh, I just wanted to also come in a little bit on Piyusha's question about gender. I think that's you know mm -hmm. absolutely central to what's been happening in the transformation of Bangalore's uh, workforce for sure. Because what you had earlier was uh, you know this engineering, electronics, high technology industries, 
um, pretty much always dominated by men. And what you have now, the industrial workforce is really largely dominated by the garment industry, which is largely women. And it's not only women, but it's also, uh, you know, young migrant women, which are, which form a very precarious sort of workforce within the city uh, of Bangalore. They don't sort of last very long in their jobs. There's a lot of turnover. So there is a very gendered nature to this shift at the sort of city scale. Uh, of course, when you look at the neighborhood scale, you see a very different uh, set of changes and you see very different implications for gender. But I think gender is uh, absolutely very much at the heart of uh, this transformation uh, as well. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, uh, Shreya. And uh, great that you've also picked up other questions. I think uh, if the, the next speakers, if they also have some general comments apart from the specific ones addressed to them, please uh, do, do address them. Uh, as well. Maybe we can continue with Owen. There was a direct question from, sorry, you still didn't mention your first name. So D. Wilson too, uh, to, uh, to Owen. Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Um, okay, what I meant, okay, is that, that the industrialization, the decline in the numbers of the people employed in the manufacturing sector was not the statistical cause of the growing numbers of people employed in high income technical, managerial, professional jobs. Okay, and I, I agree fully with you that there's been a growth of uh, what should we call it, um, high-tech industrial employment. You know, and I think you could, you could include in that certain kinds of artisan jobs, but I'm thinking largely of technically trained people who are employed increasingly in say the manufacturing sector. But, so what I'm saying is that if you look inside, if you look at the statistical trends within each sector, you'll see that this professionalizing trend has taken place. Even in manufacturing, there was a decline in low-skilled, low-wage jobs and middle-income manual jobs and a growth in high-income technical jobs and also managerial jobs and some professional jobs. So, you know, so it's not the decline of manufacturing employment that resulted in the growth of high-income technical and professional managerial jobs. Within each of these sectors, the same trend is occurring. I think what's happening is that businesses are responding to trade unions and to new technological developments by intensifying production, by using more machinery, high levels of automation, which requires fewer manual, middle, you know, middle what should we call them, semi-skilled workers, uh, fewer artisans and more technicians, and you know, high-end workers. So that I think is, that, that, that's the argument I think I'm trying to make. Thanks very much, um, Owen. Um, and I think there was a, a direct question to Anna from Seth. Yes, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, this is something that I didn't have the time to, to um, go into during uh, the presentation. Indeed, the first maps that I showed are a very recent ones. So these companies are still uh, trying to somehow rely on what was established during the non-aligned um, movement. I would say uh, possibly because of um, their inability to really compete on the more advanced um, European markets. And so uh, what I've, they have also maintained is, um, so there's been, you know, this kind of deindustrialization of what was the production side of these companies. So that has kind of gone because it was done within national borders. But what has been uh, retained is this kind of uh, um, engineering know-how that is used as a basis for this kind of technical cooperation, especially with countries in um, Central and Southern Africa, so Tanzania, Zambia, et cetera. But I know that, for example, Serbia is also looking into, you know, establishing uh, partnerships, as you said. Um, obviously, there are these, uh, these big players uh, um, at hand. And I think more broadly, what I wonder is, uh, whether there has been a shift on what is understood as development. So these companies initially were uh, quote unquote developing or helping to develop the South within the global South within the non-aligned premises, right? And therefore the role of enterprises within it was to basically help building this infrastructure to allow countries to develop themselves and become self-reliant. And now I think this has partly changed 
um, but the, the, the main premise of development through technical cooperation, I think, has, um, has remained. However, yeah, more, more broadly, uh, um, you know, the question of whether there is some scope for broader progressive politics within this, uh, this context is, yeah, it's quite complex. And I would like to, to hear more from also the other participants what, you know, what they think in this kind of uh, uh, context of multipolarity. Thanks. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, I think that kind of apart from you're quite right pointing out that Seth's question, you know, could potentially also be answered by by all the others. Uh, but we still have also the two other big questions, if you like, um, um, Piusha's question about the gendered landscapes, um, and then Steve's question about uh, why is it that uh, there seems to be so much work on state actors and uh, not so much on on capital. Um, so, you know, I'll probably ask the rest of the panel, uh, you can also answer or pick up any other points, of course, that you uh, might want to uh, pick up. Um, and maybe I will start with Niha. Sure. Uh, actually, thanks, Stephen, very much. Um, so in other work, actually, Shia and I have been uh, with another, um, I, th I think maybe a colleague of yours at Concordia, Chris Hurl, we've been doing some work on consultants and private actors in these projects as well. So um, we have been doing work around that, but I think uh, completely agree with you that, you know, the, 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 the kind of role of the state and within sort of the frames in which we, we function um, tends to, I, I think, maybe overshadow a bunch of the others. But I think partly, at least speaking from the Indian context, I think the it's almost impossible to not include the state even when we are studying private actors because as the work we've done on consultants uh, shows that you know even all of this, this this discussion about sort of the state being hollowed out and there being no more room for sort of national and, and regional governments, we find in, in the Indian context at least even though private sector actors are becoming more and more prominent the terms of their engagement are set very much by the state. And so if we want to understand what uh, non-state actors, whoever they are, whether it's capital or whether it's you know community organizations or whoever they are, it's really important to understand the modalities within which they function, which are actually laid down and set down by the state. Um, yeah, so I think that's really uh, where I, I, I would put that. Thanks, thanks very much. Um... Maybe moving on to Magdalena. Yeah, I, I think in the case of, of Chile, uh, the cases that I showed are uh, more rural than urban. I, I know Stephen's question was uh, also connected to the urban frame, but uh, the, the cases that I was investigating before Lotan that I continue working with, it's, it's an urban uh, town, obviously. Uh, and I think that happens similarly maybe to what uh, Nia just said. Uh, it's impossible to not connect uh, the state to both the capitalist and neoliberal dynamics that take place, especially in the case of Chile, because both those in power in the state are the same that own uh, transnational corporations or con or do the links with transnational corporations in Chile. So there is a very complex dynamic between the elites, the political elites and the economic elites. So in the case of the forestries, for example, here in Chile, uh, families, the, the five families that own forestries in Chile are also um, active political actors many times within the state. So I think uh, how it plays out is very different, for example, from the US, where I think you can do a kind of separation, but in Chile, I think you can't. Um, and that's why uh, the case of Mulchen, the, the second that I showed, uh, makes that very clear uh, in terms of the, the repression of the workers uh, during the dictatorship. It wasn't just the state, it was a committee uh, composed by military police, landowners, uh, yeah, landowner civilians. So they really act together. And I think that trend continues uh, until these days. Thanks, thanks very much, Magdalena. Uh, Xu Fei, do you want to come in um, the discussion? Oh, sure. Um, I think in 
probably most countries, the state and capital are not separable. They are always and, uh, intertwined. And China is probably an extreme case. Uh, the state is the capital. <laughs> uh, in other words, the state at all levels, central, provincial, and city level, provides most of the capital uh, investment in not only in post-industrial city, cities, in all cities. Um, and the, uh, that's how, that's, that's my <laughs> view. And on the scale question, city versus neighborhood, um, of course, I don't think there's any contradiction. We should probably do both. And um, um, as, uh, while reading the literature, I, I, I was thinking how, how can we tell um, an interesting story of um, um, specific places, um, individual uh, cities, and I think uh, the focus on the neighborhood is really a great approach because then you can really focus on the uh, life stories, individual experiences. That's something I haven't done in the past. So I appreciate your, 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 your suggestion. I would definitely uh, uh, do that uh, as I start working on the project. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Uzat. Oops, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. I'm here. I'm sorry. Yes, um, in my case, um, I guess state has been really influential in terms of switching from one um, regime of accumulation to another. I mean, I just talked about uh, the coup d'etat that started it all with regards to new liberalization, right? And from then on, um, in my case, again, in the peripheral setting of Gebze, uh, we witnessed uh, a kind of, uh, you know, microcosmos of what uh, could happen uh, under neoliberalization and in only a couple of decades. I'm talking about uh, four decades of huge changes. And, um, and I was there, to be honest, I was there as a resident, you know, I grew up in that city. And now looking back, I can make sense of all this. So uh, capital in that sense has always been on uh, or under the wings of the state. And uh, with the current uh, you know, authoritarian turn, as they call it, uh, it has uh, you know, um, gotten more strong, those ties. Um, but also uh, state has been uh, the leading, uh, has the leading role rather than opening the way for capitalist accumulation. Uh, state has been uh, pretty active to uh, dominate the capital uh, accumulation um, through urban transformation projects. So uh, in my uh, research, I'm trying to show how this has unfolded uh, or manifested uh, through and over urban space, specifically um, uh, peripheral urban space, because on the one hand, we have Istanbul, you know, marching towards being a global city. On the other hand, we have Gebze, uh, the periphery, uh, which was has been uh, receiving uh, the factories, heavy industry, right? Um, but the thing is, almost all of those factories, uh, you know, production plants, uh, their headquarters are based in Istanbul, right? And uh, for authoritarian AKP government, I mean, it, uh, Istanbul has always had the upper hand in with regards to their accumulation uh, strategies, uh, predominantly real estate uh, based uh, strategies. So um, I would say, again, I tried to give a kind of hint of this in my uh, presentation. Uh, we definitely need to take a look at uh, the um, state of democracy with regards to deindustrialization and relevant uh, you know, strategies after that. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Uzat. Um, Lauren has uh, posted the uh, files of Max and um, and um, Tarek's presentation in the chat, so please do download it. Um, but uh, I was going to um, give the word back to Seth, who has also um, uh, raised his hand, so that uh, fits quite well. So Seth, <laughs> over to you. I just wanted to come in on this point because I think it's a great question, the way I interpreted Stephen's question, um, you know, he pointed out that there was quite a 
a, a significant focus on the, the state. And I guess it's, it's something like, does the state take center stage when research is situated at the urban scale, as opposed to say, just situated at a national or internet global scale. And there might be some truth to that, but I think another thing that we haven't mentioned yet is that the nature of the state is changing to some extent in the last few years partly because of COVID, but I think it was a change that was already underway. So you can see even like IBRD has this report about the return of the, the state. Um, it was, what was it called? The state strikes back, which kind of made the state look like the bad guys and, you know, kind of imposing on markets. Um, and so I, I think there's definitely kind of return in some ways of the state, but exactly what it's, it's, exactly how it's manifesting differs, of course, significantly across place and time. The one article I think I would strongly recommend is Daniela Gabor's Wall Street Consensus. So she says that it's, you know, we're in this post-Washington consensus world. She calls it the Wall Street Consensus, where you've now got this, this marriage between finance capital and, and, and development policy, basically. I mean, like big D development policy. Um, and so big D development policy now is like, Basically, there's a there's scope for the state to be active in ways that it wasn't in the Washington consensus. But exactly how, um, you know, there's it's still very much on the side of capital. States have to assume the risk. It's kind of an old story. States can spend, uh, you know, you can states can do whatever they want as long as they assume the risk and private sector uh, captures the reward. Is basically she calls it the de-risking state. But it does afford scope for states to uh, implement spatialized industrial policies. So we're seeing kind of the spatialization of industrial policy in, you know, everywhere from Kenya, Thailand, Saudi Arabia, uh, Tanzania. If you look at the industri industrial policies that are being released now, they're heavily spatialized. So it's these large scale infrastructure projects that Nea was talking about, um, geared toward like kind of literally plugging places into global production networks. And, and usually it's kind of places that have been deindustrializing for some time trying to kind of restart um, capital accumulation. Thanks very much, Seth. And um, uh, I think Magdalena just put the link to the article by Daniela Gabor into the chat. So if you want to, to download it, um, that's, uh, that's great. We still have the question from Xufei uh, about depot. Um, which is a vast question. Maybe I could hand over to Depot's um, chairman for life, um, Stephen, uh, to say a few words. <laughs> or is this an impossible task? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's not. It's not just a Canadian project. <laughs> it's it's a transnational project, and and I, and part of the idea is that a lot of the field, you know, a lot of the study of 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 industrial change, this field has sort of emerged in the U.S. context. And much of the scholarship is focused on, you know, localities, on individual places. And so what we're trying to do is try to connect the dots in a way, start to sort of see water patterns, right, without losing the lived experience of working people. And that's the challenge, right? How do you, how do you scale up your analysis without losing <laughs> losing the people in a way, uh, particularly working class people who are being displaced quite literally. Um, and so it's a seven year project where we are, uh, it's six countries, but we're, we're interested in, in wider linkages. You can't, uh, you can't understand this unless it's, it's thinking about it more globally. And so certainly this panel is a, is a reflection of that. We had one earlier on Australia. And so I guess one of the questions that we, we were, we're sort of chewing on is, you know, you know, like how, what does it change when we, when we sort of think about, you know, deindustrialization globally or in the, in the global South or India or China, what does that, how does that change our, our understanding of it anywhere, right? Not just in those places, but how does that reframe it? And, and so, um, uh, so the project is, you know, again, also trying to break some of the isolation of these, you know, these, these, these communities that have been, you know, left behind. And, and so we're working with, um, you know, industrial heritage museums and organizations and, and uh, we we're planning like an exhibition, they'll be simultaneous connecting many of these places together, you know, through, through story and so on. Um, I can go on, but I, you know, that's generally what we're trying to do. And, 
yeah, and it's funded by a Canadian research uh, foundation, like uh, the main funder of academic research in Canada, but it's a it's a international project. But we want to make connections with other people. So if people who are studying other places in the world are interested in joining Depot, you know, there are pathways into our project. And so we could certainly talk to you about that. We'd love to make wider connections. Anyway. Thanks very much, Stephen. And uh, Lauren, uh, always on the ball, uh, has in the chat now put uh, several links to uh, newsletters, uh, websites, Twitter, uh, where you can uh, learn uh, more than you pr probably ever wanted to know about, uh, about uh, Depot. Um, uh, Suchitana. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask the question. Uh, brilliant papers. I was uh, just thinking aloud, like uh, in terms of uh, deindustrialization. Uh, in case of India, for example, uh, it is, uh, see, in India, the, we have different kinds of cities. Like Calcutta is one kind of city, uh, Varanasi, Benares is one kind of city, Agra is one kind of city. So we have different kinds of towns and urban spaces, which are very cultural, uh, culture specific, society specific, ethnocentric. So we have very different kinds of spaces, but with industrialization, especially post uh, globalization era, uh, we are say, uh, seeing that ancient spaces like uh, cities like Benra, cities like say Surat, those uh, cultural spaces are somehow being altered or changed physically uh, and being homogenized. So, you know, it's a kind of loss of heritage, uh, uh, which is happening with that kind of uh, process of globalization uh, to make a city which has its own uh, culture, which previously had its own culture, but it is making it more and more homogenized to fit into the agenda of globalization. So I was wondering that uh, whether we are losing out uh, something in terms of urban space, and if you can reflect on that. Thank you very much, Suchitana. It's uh, probably addressed uh, mostly to Nia and Shriya. I don't know whether either of you two want to come in here. Sure, um, I can try. I mean, it's a it's a really sort of vast uh, question and, and sort of really broad question to try and um, answer. I, I think that um, I mean I, I think that our cities are just undergoing change in multiple ways, not just through industrialization or deindustrialization. I think there are lots of different ways, and not only through global capital, but also locally. Uh, there are, there are things that that are changing the landscape. You know, as as cities grow and evolve. So I'm I'm not. Again, I'm, I'm not really sure, particularly in a country like India and in, you know, knowing how cosmopolitan a lot of our, uh, you know, urban regions are, uh, I, I'm, I would hesitate to put down sort of a single definition of culture uh, or the city's identity uh, on, onto any single place. Uh, and I, I think that that actually what makes a lot of our cities quite vibrant is, is the kind of the, the, the change, the mix and the and the and the you know the, the the transformation that happens all the time. I think the the thing that we do need to be mindful of, mindful of is that um, at what cost is is the transformation coming, um, and at whose cost. Uh, and so so I think that it's it's really important to to sort of not you know kind of hold out against change for change's sake, but to, to actually think through what it means uh, for change to come and you know, and, and who's kind of at the receiving end of these things. And I think that's really, uh, in especially in Indian cities, it's really hard to kind of, uh, you know, sort of, especially with, with not enough room available for public participation. I think it's really hard to, to kind of uh, break that down, especially in terms of the planning process. Okay, thank you. I don't know, Shreya, do you want to add something or are you happy? No, okay, very good. Um, well, the, uh, I'm just looking around. Are there any other questions? We still have got four minutes. We want to use every minute, if possible, of uh, uh, the two hours. 
maybe then I will misuse my position uh, to uh, ask a final question. Because I mean, one of my special interests is uh, memories of the industrialization uh, as they are expressed through forms of tangible or in the tangible industrial heritage. And I guess Xu Fei's paper addressed that uh, specifically with uh, relation to Harbin, which is also a city I've been. Um, but um, in the global south, generally, uh, of course, um, I think uh, one of the points that uh, is made amongst others by my colleague Marion Steiner from, from Chile um, is that um, the global south in, in the global south, there's, obvious, there's often the problem of uh, how to validate industrial heritage. Um, because uh, in a way, industry developed first, if we follow the history of industrialization uh, in the global north. So, you know, in Britain in the 50s and 60s, you have this notion, we were the pioneers, we were the first industrial nation, and therefore, in a way, industrial heritage becomes immediately connected to a kind of national telos almost. Um, uh, so, sort of, uh, sort of, uh, it's, it's again a vast question, but um, how is or how are attempts to justify industrial heritage legitimated uh, in the global south? If there's always that kind of, I guess, what Deepesh Chakrabarti in 2000 called the kind of waiting room of history uh, for many of those countries in the global south. Can I offer Seth? one? Yeah. I'll just offer one uh, uh, one answer, and I think there are probably many ways. But um, before the pandemic, so one of my research sites, I, uh, the la one of the last places I was doing research at was was Tanzania, and if you visit some of the some of the the the, the older factories, I mean, one of them is called Urafiki. It's a, it's a textile mill. It means friendship in Swahili, and it was an early Chinese overseas development aid project. And if you go there, you still see um, um, like th there are photographs of, of Mao in, inside the chairman's room. And it's like going back in time. And I understood it as kind of, um, it's a memory of a certain period of African socialism, a certain period of post Tanzania's post-colonial journey that some people um, remember very fondly. And so, yeah, quite simply, it's, it's not so different, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. uh, from what you just mm -hmm. said about, you know, Britain remembering a period of, of, this, of this country's history. Um, you could certainly say the same for Tanzania. So also connected, I guess, to forms of identification, what Stuart Hall calls identification, and um, uh, whether it's in terms of class or nation or um, ethnicity in some cases, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we've almost reached the magical two hours. So uh, thank you very much for a great session. Uh, Fred Burrell put in the chat that it was the best session he attended so far amongst the depot sessions. And that's saying something because certainly some of the other sessions were really amazing too. So uh, a big thank you to uh, all uh, our presenters. Uh, really great, uh, lots of inspiration here. And we would love if you would continue to connect to depot uh, events and uh, we'd love to keep the kind of conversation going um, uh, because you know one of the things in Depo is it's it's largely countries from the global north uh, who are directly presented in the project but as Stephen said I think it will be hugely important to uh, also talk and keep talking uh, uh, in a more global way about the meanings and the narratives of uh, the industrialization. Uh, and uh, finally, I, I think I should have been better prepared, but um, maybe I can look to Lauren, uh, because I think I should advertise the next uh, depot event uh, at the end of this one. Um, uh, Lauren, can you perhaps help me out here? Yeah, so the um, next event is on curating and archiving deindustrialization. So I think that it's going to be another really interesting panel and it's definitely going to follow directly from some of our last comments. Um, I'm just popping the link to register into ah, the chat. Perfect. Very and it's good. one month away on November 19th, I believe. Great. So you see it in the chat and you have the link uh, there. Um, please do register if you haven't already registered and hoping to see many of you uh, there again. Uh, so have a great day or evening or morning, wherever you uh, may be. 
Um, and uh, thanks very much again. See you soon. Thank you. Bye.